And hopefully we've learned lessons from the Emerald Ash Borer. Because most often people don't care until it's in their backyard. And we're trying to make take a different approach. And we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna ask for your help. So with that, we're moving forward. We're gonna we're gonna share. Here's Tom and my recent attempts at getting <laughs> getting insects under control. It doesn't work very well. We like to feel safe in our little bubble. And guess what happens to our little bubble? Something always comes along and pops it. All right? But with that, know that education's only good. Here's young Tom. <laughs> it's only good if we apply it. And so this is actually, we're going to teach you and ask you to help us with this program. So here's our, here's our thoughts. I'm going to start, I'm going to identify the resources that are available at this point, or soon will be available. We want to make you aware of the state spotted lanternfly work group, aware of the OSU spotted lanternfly task force, where the spotted lanternfly is currently in the United States, the spotted lanternfly biology and life cycle. Then Tom's going to take over and help us with identifying favorite food sources, look-alikes, confusing maybe, of the, the favorite food source for the spotted lanternfly, then how you can help. That's boots on the ground, eyes in the sky, identifying sites, and how to adopt a tree of heaven. All right, so with this, here's what's beginning to happen. On the right-hand side of the screen, over here, I, can, I guess I can highlight this, over here, this is the, the typical cards that we put together for like the tick cards and everything else. We now have one for the spotted lanternfly. This one right here. Here's the front side. Here's the back side. We also have this pull-up um, display that maybe we can get around to, to fairs, but of course, we have no idea if county fairs are even going to fly this year. It's all, it's all in a state of flux, which bothers some people, but hey, that's just the nature of, the, of education and what's going on. So here's our designated website. I think Amy told me that this, she was hoping to have this up this Friday. I don't know if it's going to be, so th there'll be a Go OSU address right here. It will be a Go OSU, and then we'll, it'll either be SLF. Of course, spotted the spotted lanternfly or spot the spot. But this website will be kind of the, the main source for you to go to see fact sheets, recorded PowerPoints, videos, any other upcoming events, all the instructions, anything to do with the spotted lanternfly and Ohio State University will be at this dedicated website. And once we get the actual address, we'll send an information, a and an email out to you to update you so that you're aware of it. Here's one that's going in. This fact sheet just came out the other day. You can see right here, April 22nd is where this was. Be alert for the spotted lanternfly. Well, you're going to be even more alert because we're going to take you through what this, this is the task force. This is the task force put together to deal with the spotted lanternfly, you can see the constituents of this Ohio Department of Agriculture, the USDA APHIS, that's Animal Plant Health, uh, shoot, something security, insect, ah, Plant Health Insect Security, and this is plant, plants, <laughs> well, we could say people, but that doesn't make sense. Oh, look plant it up, protection, Jennifer. ah. Plant protection quality, or anyway, it'll come out later. Oh, okay. This is the one that, that comes in and says, hey, if we're going to eradicate this, they come in and they tell everybody we're taking all these trees out, and they do it regardless of whatever they're doing. Whether people want them or not, that's what happened down in Claremont County with the Asian longhorn beetle. Also, we're a big part of this. Ohio State University Extension is a huge part of this. Uh, as well as the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, 
ODNR. So these are the these are the players in this spotted lantern fly action, action plan. And here's some of the players in from Ohio State. Amy here is our invasive queen. We've got Kathy Smith. Here's Tom, myself, but this is these are just a few of the people involved in trying to control, well, not control, trying to manage this new invasive insect. Tom will tell you later how he has a great setup for the Gledden. We say Gledden, but it's the Great Lakes, G-L-E-D-N, the Great Lakes Early Detection Network. Tom will show you how to use this app because it becomes important for us for tracking as well as identifying. So he'll talk about that on his portion. But here's what we want you to do. We want you to join the battle to beat the bug. All right? Not really a bug. I, it, if an entomologist would freak out at that. It's actually a, it's a true bug, actually. So, spotted lanternfly. What is it? Well, here's, here's its Latin, the species, Lycorma delicatula. Oh, that sounds great, doesn't it? Well, this is a very intriguing insect. Native to China. Uh, it's also been now in Vietnam. Cambodia, Thailand. In North America, in September 14th, when this all started, intriguingly enough, there was an active one, they felt one active infestation found in southeastern Pennsylvania, but that has exploded. So the first time it was found was right here, Berks County, there in PA, over on the easternmost side of Pennsylvania. So we were all kind of like, oh, well, a new invasive, eh, not a big deal. We probably won't see it until, well, it'll take a long time to get across to, because it's a poor flyer. We said, eh, eh so we're not, it'll probably take three, four years before it gets anywhere near we have, where, where, where we have to worry about it. So we we're just like, oh, okay, that's just something new. Well, active infestations have been found. Life stage has been found in many more states. And I want to show you the evolution of this. So as of, as of November 25th, this was 2019, this is where the infestations are. Let me explain a little bit about this. You'll note that in these areas of blue, those are those where spotted lanternfly infestations have been found. When we talk about infestation, that means adults, eggs, and nymphs, the full range, all life cycles, all life stages, sorry, all life stages has have been found. While the yellows, here these yellows, adults or some stage has been found, but they haven't found the the entire life cycle. Therefore, they don't consider it, consider it an infestation. So adults were found here at the, and in November when Joe Boggs and I, Amy, and even Tom was in on this, we got together and pulled this presentation together. And, and at that time, Joe Boggs made an interesting statement. He said, it's probably too late for eradication. We were like, eh, Joe, that seems a little, he said, oh, the bar... look, the horse is out. There's no sense trying to close the door. The horse is out of the barn. Well, you know, actually, he turned out to be, Joe was right. So here's September 18th. I just want to show you the progress. You can see Virginia, Maryland is involved, one county in Maryland. Here's Delaware, one county in Delaware, others there. Here's Delaware. Then most of it has been, of course, in Pennsylvania, some findings in New York, some in Connecticut, one in Maine, all right? Well, here's November 12th. Look what's happened. We've now got this entire county as well as it's beginning to progress through. Let's go back. What happened here? Check it out. Virginia, Maryland. Now, we have West Virginia. 
We have North Carolina, where even though West Virginia has an infestation, so again, it's important to understand that means all life cycle, all port, all stages of the life cycle have been found here, even down in North Carolina now. But this was December 12th. Well, look what happened. January 2nd, 2020, right here. Look what's going on. And what color is it? Blue. That means all stages of the life cycle have been found in Beaver and Allegheny County. Here's the latest, March 5th. They switched out from the yellow to now there's a purple dot. It gives you just a little bit more clarity. But you can see this insect is continuing to move across the country throughout the east coast, easternmost coast. But this is where we are most concerned about right here, this area right here. So if we look at this, we blow up PA right now. Well, not bl literally blow them up, but we, we enlarge where we're looking at. Here's the areas. These are all the counties that have been, that are in the quarantined area with all the life cycle stages present in this county. So we started here in a single county and look what's happened. If we, if we kind of pull back and look at, now they give us, now they've given us in the darker blues, you can see these are the areas that they are aware in the townships that have the infestations present. But look over here in Beaver and Allegheny. Well, it's interesting because there was a guy, Pop, David Pop, one day had a lot of time on his hands. And so what he did, decided to do, he says, I'm gonna take the rail yards and I'm gonna look at these rails and see if this seems to match up. Well, what do you see? It follows those railways pretty darn well. We are concerned because follow this over here. We have rails going out Youngstown area, but also coming up into Ashtabula. Well, all along, our concern has been rail yards. So here's the preferred host. This is what the spotted lanternfly loves more than any other plant, the tree of heaven. Alanthus altissima. You just, don't you just love kind of saying that name? Alanthus altissima. It's, it's a great name for Latin species there. But it also loves grapes. Wow, what's up along the lake? What's big part of Lake County? Grapevines, wineries, interesting. So here's a chance now. So you can answer the question, what do you think are predators for the spotted lanternfly? You go down on your left side, you click on that little microphone if you have an answer. What do you think are predators for the spotted lanternfly? Unmute yourself. Give me an answer. Praying mantis. Praying mantis. Very good. Anything else? No other guesses? How about birds? Excellent. Birds are a great thought, too. Well, you are exactly right with the praying mantis. Here's a Chinese mantis. This one it was brought over... And it's it's a good predator. It, it's a not it's an it's not a discriminating predator, meaning it'll be eat honeybees, but it will eat the spotted lanternfly. Here is our native species. This is the Carolina mantis. This one is is native to our to North America. They both eat the spotted lanternfly. And we said, ah, you know what? Birds should be able to eat these. Well, you know what happens when birds eat these things? They vomit. The, apparently, the fluids or the, the toxins or the bitter flavors that are in the tree of heaven reside in that insect as it feeds on it. So when the birds eat them, this is what the birds do. They literally, so there really isn't, there really isn't another predator other than these. And how much can these eat? 
Well, look, if you eat one insect, that, ins that praying mantis, mantis is probably good for at least two to three days. It's gotten enough food from that, that one feeding. So that's not a real defined way, a good way for predators to come in and, and, and kind of try and control this insect. It's not very good at all. So birds vomiting from it, which is not a good thing. But in Virginia, when we look at the host list, here's some of the species that we see that they have found Othesia, the eggs on the, these plants. Now to be a host plant for an insect, this is important to understand too. Host plant means an insect can eat, can feed on the plant and complete its entire life cycle. There's a lot of plants that insects will kind of munch on, but they can't complete their life cycle. There's something, the, the nutrients, the, the, whether it's nutri nutrients or other, other compounds in those plants, they can't complete their life cycle. These all, with the exception of, yes, the 55-gallon drum here on the bottom, this, these hosts, this is where the eggs were found. Here's where they found that they were fed on, but no eggs were laid on these plants. So even though they can sustain themselves on it, they still need some other, some other nutrient, some other compound from their favored host to be able to complete their life cycle. So we talk about host, there's possibly 70 host plants for this insect. All right, so this is a hemiptera, half wings is what they're known as, but these are plant hoppers. This is a true plant hopper. What does that mean? Well, we know there's one generation in PA, thank heavens. In Ohio, we're hoping, at least up north here, we're pretty certain we'll only have one generation per year. Down south, maybe in Cincy, maybe in Cincinnati, they might have two generations per year, but at least for us up here in the north end, we're probably only gonna have one generation per year of this plant hopper. They are big insects. Here's the female in the middle, much larger. Here's the males on each side of her, one inch long, half an inch wide. You're not, you, you think, well, will I miss these? Well, it's always interesting because you think something that is this large you can't miss, it's, it's easy to do. They're good. They're good with their camouflage. Even though it's another large sized Asian import, the realities are this, this plant hopper and the classic plant hopper has these tent like wings folded over its back, kind of a rounded, rounded wings. And these are typical because they, they love to tap into plants. They have this piercing, sucking mouth part right here. They tap into plants, and it's not just young stems. They can, even though it's younger ones, they can tap into the bark of older trees through that bark, secondary bark, secondary phloem, and tap into the to this phloem here that carries all of the nutrients, water, sugars created in the leaves. They tap right into that. They, they are gregarious. They love feeding in swarms. And at this level, this is where our concern starts to elevate. We're not too worried about trees in the forest. Where we're worried is in young vineyards, well, vineyards in, entirely, but not only fruit trees, but also wineries. Because they can kill with not, not necessarily outright kill, but because they're extracting that phloem, those sugars, those resources are not flowing down into the roots of the, of the grapevine. And because of that, they will actually lower that plant's ability to tolerate cold in winter. They, they're, they're more susceptible to damage from the winter by this insect with its heavy feeding. And you can see, man, that's pretty tremendous amount. 
as they're tapping into that phloem, they're extracting all the sugars, and what they're looking for are amino acids. And those amino acids, what they do with the rest of the sugars, they poop it out. They excrete it. We call that honeydew. The honeydew is really heavy around these plants, as well as sooty mold. It's, sooty mold is a fungus that grows on this honeydew that they are excreting. They do not bite or sting people. They merely feed on the sap from the trunk, the stem, and the leaves of their favorite host, but other hosts. They have what's called aposomatic coloration. What this means is this insect, as birds or predators approach, they'll flap up, they'll pull their wings up. They're actually, they're, they're hard, that half wing. They'll pull their wings up and flash this red meaning, hey, I'm bad tasting. Don't, don't bite me. Don't eat me because if you do, you're, you're going to get a taste of these alkaloids that they have picked up. They flash that display when they're disturbed. You'll see multiple pictures. They don't always have this, this really highly colored yellow. It's actually a beautiful insect. I mean, I, I hate to admit this because Joe Boggs will be all over me. It is a beautiful insect, incredibly beautiful. You have yellow down here. You have this white and black and reds. It's, it's incredibly beautiful, but it also can create quite a bit of damage. They're poor flyers. Think of them as a moth. You know, moths, how they flutter around to the lights. They're not strong flyers. They're just fluttering around and they're looking for host plants to feed on. They hold their wings tent-like, like true plant hoppers. Here's that wing-like appearance on the back with their wings. There's their, his proboscis, his big, that mouth part that he will literally shove past the bark into the phloem of the, of the plant. What's the impact? Well, when they feed, and this is, when they feed, they'll puncture into that bark and they create a little opening, a tiny opening. So you start to get this bleeding. I hate the term bleed, this oozing of sap. Plants can't bleed. They don't have blood, so they can't bleed, but they ooze this sap. And you can see the more punctures there are, it tends to just flow right on down the tree. The other side of that, blue, black sooty mold. So when we're, we're going to ask you to go out, look for these insects, these are some of the key aspects. This black sooty mold on leaves under the tree, these, these, this oozing spots on, on trees, as well as one of the other key factors, just like around fair time, the dang yellow jackets are all over, will be all over this trunk too, as well as the bald-faced hornets. The adults will appear in late summer. They feed, they mate, and lay eggs. Again, just looking at this picture right here, you can see the females. They're much larger than the males. Here they are mating. Then she'll lay 30 to 50 eggs. Here's the eggs. She lays them in these rows. And then even though she's got, they're out there on the, on the trunk of that tree in the previous picture, she'll cover them up with this waxy coating. Egg masses will be one to inch, inch, inch to one and a half inches wide, a half to three, or sorry, inch to inch and a half long, half an inch, half to three quarter inch wide. She lays them down and then she covers them up. And you can see there's a difference between fresh versus as it dries down. You can see right here at the top, she hasn't quite totally covered them up. There's all kinds. And we want you to know, here's a fresh egg mass. Look at the difference between this fresh egg mass versus this older one. And then right next to it, we've got a gypsy moth egg mass. The gypsy moth looks like this kind of felt 
beige felt covered patch. This looks like someone threw a, a mud on the tree and it's stuck there. While this is nice, shine, this kind of shiny, waxy looking covering of those eggs. Well, here they are again. They're laid on any flat surface. How many egg masses do you see there? Remember, unmute yourself. How many egg masses do you see? We'll see how sharp they are there, Tom. How many egg masses do you see in that picture? <laughs> They're smart. They're not even answering. <laughs> how many egg masses do you see? Three. Three. Okay. There's three readily apparent, but there's actually six there. Here we go. Here's one that's dried up here. Here's another dried up one here. One, so one, two, three, four. Here's one that's really dry. Four, five, six. Six egg masses there. Can't see. So even though you think, ah, this will be easy to pick up, no big deal. You got to look. You really got to look and see. Here you can see there's one, two, three here. But turns out one of their favorite spots to lay eggs is on rusty things. Here's the bottom of this can. Check this out. Look at these egg masses there. So they love laying them anywhere, especially on rusty things. Well, think about this. Trains train cars. They're, they're always well painted, right? <laughs> no. So here we are. This is middle of Virginia, the spotted lanternfly infestation. Here's trees of heaven. And here are the rail cars. They're just along the side. And this is our fear is that we're going to see we're, as David Pop showed in that in his, as he said, you know what, this doesn't make sense in this infestation. And he tracked it, and it followed right along the train tracks pretty darn well. So here's, here's what the nymphs, the young, they'll hatch, eggs hatch in spring. You have four instar stages. Instars one through three look like this. They're just each one, it will be successively larger. So this is how the appearance, and it's actually, again, I mean, if you can't, if you can't at least appreciate, look at these black, white spots. Even you have these little speckles of blue. It's actually quite beautiful. But I won't admit that to Joe Bob. So, but here's the kicker. The third end, after the third end star, the fourth end star, when it emerges, this is what the fourth end star looks like. Almost totally different than the previous three end star stages. The instar and then the adult comes. So you've got this contrast of from one through three, four. Totally different appearance. Here's the life cycle summary from starting eggs, hatch. You got the first, second, third, fourth instar to the adults. Cycle starts over again. So if we put it out on a chart, here's the eggs. You can see how long the eggs are around. You can see the nymphs are present from hatch. Probably this is delayed. This, I'm definitely going to be delayed till probably about mid-June for us this year, at least. Then the rest, the, here's the nymphs. And then you've got adults from July through December until a really hard freeze kills them. The adults are out moving around. You can see the longest stage of that life cycle for being spread is the egg, that egg stage. They're weak flyers. So really the adults aren't, aren't as prominent a way for other than occasional hitchhikers because they'll ride up in the tire wells, people pulling their campers back from where they left them. They will be stuck on there and we'll find them. But what we're really concerned about is trying to manage them. So the one of the, here's the options, destroy the egg masses. You can, you can see, 
they, in PA, they're tr encouraging people to scrape the egg masses off, smash them. Sticky bands have been used to a certain extent. Insecticides, the fertilized females. Now where we're kind of moving is the tree of heaven. Moving the tree of heaven, the people have suggested, we'll just cut out all the tree of, trees of heaven and we'll, con we'll control them. Ah, that's not true. Remember, they have 70 host plants. Host meaning true host, meaning that they can do, can, can perform and complete their entire life cycle on that host plant. So actually what we're doing with trees of heaven, we're identifying them, but now we're using them down here. We're actually treating them with systemic insecticides and using that as a kind of a trap. And when they come in to feed on them, they get a dose of that insecticide and it kills the adults. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to be a part of this process. Join the battle, beat the bug. Monitor the tree of heaven is what we're going, Tom's gonna walk us through. We want you to monitor some trees of heaven. If we do it right, hey, we can, we can do the best to slow this down. And now we're on to ID fun. Tom's going to take it over on to IDing that, this plant. That's a, that's a nice last slide, Draper. <laughs> nice <laughs> slide. So a, a little background information. So uh, USDA APHIS, USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture. APHIS stands for Animal Protection Health Inspection Service. And then the PPQ is plant protection and quarantine. So, um, and all, I can send this out. There was a webinar that was done on Ralstonia. It is a disease that has infected geraniums in Michigan. Um, Ball Seed Company was the one that imported them. And it was a very interesting, in fact, I'm writing a Beagle article with uh, Beth Schechenhoff equating what they're doing with Ralstonia and what we're doing with COVID-19. And it's much of it has to do with uh, contact tracing. And so a lot of what um, the PPQ or the Plant Protection and Quarantine Division does is they contract tra contact trace to find out where the infection began. And one of the things they know about Ralstonia, it has been considered a bioterrorism weapon. If, if it got going in the United States, it could wipe out tomatoes, eggplants. It would be devastating. So that's just something that APHIS, um, USDA APHIS, and we're working with them with this uh, with this spotted lanternfly. That's part of one of our one of our partners on that. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. And Eric, do me a favor and just uh, if you would tell me. Um, if you would tell me just to make sure that I am um, advanced, not going too quick, all right? Yeah. All right. Got it. All right. So, um, you know, the tree of heaven, that, and so that basically, many of you know what tree of heaven is, or at the end of this presentation, hopefully you will. Um, who cares about tree of heaven? Well, we do because it is the um, host plant for spotted lanternfly. And this is really, when you think about Eric's map that he showed you about infestation and beaver, and um, oh, by the way, if I, I, I'm showing that I'm unstable, if I get kicked off, just hang around. <laughs> uh, That's you a guys, reality. You guys know I'm unstable. <laughs> so, so if we look at this map, and you're seeing the map of the wineries in the Grand River region, if you look down on the bottom right-hand corner where you see the plus and the minus, and you'll see the words Beaver Falls, that's Beaver County right there. So the map that Eric showed you, that's the Pennsylvania border that goes straight down from Conneaut down to East Liverpool. But that's where Beaver County is, and that's where the infestation is. So we're very concerned um, because we have a lot to lose in Ashtabula County. They've estimated that this has cost Pennsylvania agriculture 40, uh, I'm sorry, $54 million at this point in time um, in losses. So it's something that we're concerned about. Um, so tree of heaven, winter and summer. The, the real key on this is going to be the um, seed pod. So if you look and um, if you're familiar with Painesville, this is actually the road right 
past the Grand River going up that hill. And this tree of heaven. Um, Come on, you're still on wineries. All right. You're still on wineries. All right. Well, good. Thanks for telling me. Sure. Tell me when it comes. There we go. All right. So this you're up. going up the road, um, this is actually a tree of heaven grouping that is on the right-hand side of Route 20, right after you hit the Grand River um, Bridge, uh, going over the Grand River into Painesville toward our office. So that's in the wintertime, and you can see those seed pods. That was about a month ago that I took that picture. They're still hanging on. And then on the right-hand side, you see the summer, um, what the summer seed pods look like. And you have this kind of clustering. And, and really, the seed pods are, are going to You're someone volunteers, Master Gardener no. volunteers to come in and, and adopt the tree. And then I'm from that, here. all right. All right. So, so basically... Um, I should, I should not complain, but my wife and I are sharing an internet connection. And I won't tell you who our carrier is, but let me just tell you, it's not real good. Can you see my picture again, Eric? It's coming, starting to boot up now. We're there. All right, All right. we're good? Yep. So on the right-hand side, I was talking about the seed pods, and that really is, um, is going to be a, a very important piece to this is the seed pods. So I, I just, uh, I can't um, tell you enough that that's really the identifying factor in this. Good, your cursor's showing up. That's awesome. Ah, good. Okay. So, the but the real thing that I want you to think about is this heart-shaped bud. Can you see my heart-shaped bud there? Yep. Does it come up? Yep. So that that heart that looks like it, 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 it's very distinct heart. I mean, it's like the, you know, the picture of old, you know, you're doing your hearts on your whatever with your kids. Heart-shaped bud. That's you usually see, Valentine's there. And you can buddy. see that heart-shaped bud on the, this is a flower stalk on the right-hand side. You can see the seed pods. The seeds are off of it. But if you go down that stem, you can see that heart-shaped bud um, very distinctly. And at, even when the tree grows older, you can still see that heart-shaped bud. That um, it, And so this tree is probably, this is a bud that was probably from two years ago. Um, still showing that heart shape. So that's the leaf scar. That's where the leaf was attached to Correct. the stem. All right, heart shaped leaf scar, yeah. Yep. So uh, are you seeing the leaf picture here? Yes. Okay, so yes. In, in the bottom left hand corner, you can see the seed pods of a mature grouping of seeds. And then you see this whole uh, elongated portion is called a leaf. Okay, so we have leaves that are connected, it's a compound leaf. But on the right-hand side, you have leaflets. And if you think about poison ivy, they sometimes have that little thumb on the bottom of the, of the terminal uh, leaf. You can kind of see a little bit of a protrusion or a lobing right here, that kind of a little sticking out. But the leaf is smooth. The margin is smooth. It is not toothed. And that's so let, me, let me help you out, Tom. Let, let's, let's make a, a clarification. Remember that leaves, the true leaf, is always attached to the stem. So Tom's circling. Notice that these leaflets are not attached to the stem. This is the, not a the stem. stem of the tree. Instead, they have, this is the rachis. That's where they're they're attached to that that central portion. But that, that melon peel attaches to the stem of the tree. That's really important, whether identification or otherwise. But you'll in this, somebody comes in with a leaf and shows you what's this, if they pull one of these off, you're saying, I have no idea what's going on. So this is really important that when we talk about a leaf, that's all of those leaflets all together, that's one leaf. Does that help? Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Yeah, from, okay. and Eric, from a diagnosis standpoint, that's a great point. So if somebody brings in something from Helpline oh. and, and they just give you a leaflet, you're not sure if it's connected to the stem. It's always better for them to cut off that leaf and include some of the stem with it because then that's why you say bring me in a branch. You're getting the I'm leaf, <laughs> the stem, and the bud scar. Okay. Uh, let's move on here. So the other thing about Tree of Heaven is it has, and I've heard it referred to as alligator skin bark. Okay, it looks like alligator skin. It's got very fissured and it looks like alligator scales on it. So actually in this picture, you have the trunk of a tree of heaven. 
Right next to that, you have stalks of staghorn sumac that are coming out of the ground. And we'll talk about, that's one of the things that is easily confused with Tree of Heaven is staghorn sumac. So we'll talk about that and compare that. But this alligator bark is another thing. And if you remember back to Eric's picture where you saw the egg masses and you saw the phloem feeding and that kind of thing, you could see this uh, very fissured bark on that on those pictures. And that that was a pretty good indication that those those um, um, spotted lanternflies were feeding on Tree of Heaven. That was their host plant that they were choosing to feed on. So the background, and I don't know if you remember, well, I remember studying this when I was at Ohio State, but 30 years ago, we used to cultivate Tree of Heaven as a good street <laughs> tree because it, it is, it's super durable. It'll, it's awesome. it's, it, it'll, it'll, and down in the Columbus area, it is everywhere. I mean, it'll grow between uh, space and between two pieces of concrete. You'll get a Tree of Heaven. I think, Eric, did you say you saw some growing on the roof in Summit County or something like that? Down in Akron. Akron, yeah. I, down in Akron, as I'm traveling on Route 76, you look up in some of the older abandoned buildings, and they've got them growing out of the roofs and out of the chimneys of these. They are tough plants. So, so one of the things that gets confused with Tree of Heaven is staghorn sumac. So let's briefly talk about that. Uh, just, just a note on uh, staghorn sumac, Roost typhina. It is a native. It's, um, it's a naturalizer. It tends to grow on the edges of, um, edges of woods, but both of these plants will grow in a disturbed area. So what we tend to see is staghorn sumac as well as tree of heaven will grow in a place where, you know, railroad tracks or places where they dumped, uh, you know, dumped piles of dirt and just kind of left it there on dirt from like underneath basement excavation. So these are pretty durable trees, both of them, but they will grow together. But the difference is that, again, if we talk about that flower, um, that flower stalk, so the wintertime, I'm sorry, summertime, are you seeing the picture of the... No, it oh. came up now, yeah. So, so this is actually, so Eric, you can correct me, this is a droop fruit. It yes. is not drooping, okay? D-R-U-P-E, yes. <laughs> it's going up in the air, but staghorn sumac has this single droop that comes off of the terminal bud of the staghorn sumac. This is actually the fruit that will have the seeds on it. So this is in the summertime, around middle of July. And on the right-hand side is a picture of that same droop fruit in the winter with no foliage on it. So this is actually, this was taken probably a month ago. So you still see some of those little uh, fuzzy That's seeds. That's a droop. Out. Yeah, each one of those is a droop. So they, collectively they form that, that fruit. So, uh, but the bud scar is really something that can be very helpful to you. So are you seeing the bud scar picture? Coming now? up now. You're okay. Good now. So if you remember back to that heart-shaped bud scar, um, it, so this is a staghorn sumac bud scar, very different, almost looks like a smiley face. And the bud- Let's say leaf middle. scar. Bud scar so is leaf, a little, because yes, that leaf, bud is in the middle. So the, so, so the leaf so scar trying, is protruding Leaf down. scar. That's where it was attached. All right. Thank you, Eric. Yes. So nice to yes, have Dad. you directing me. I appreciate that. So this is the this is the um, leaf scar right here. You'll see right here is the leaf scar on the other side. Uh, but the other thing is the pubescence, very hairy. Staghorn sumac tends to be very hairy, um, whereas the um, ailanthus or tree of heaven is not. Tom, so, this is Diane. Yeah, go ahead, Diane. Can you go back to that last screen? Sure, go ahead. How come I still feel like I see a heart there? Well, but here's the thing. If we, and again, think about that heart that went all the way down. You're not seeing the, so if you think about your heart, you're not seeing that bottom pointy part. It's rounded. So you're not seeing the point going down to the center. Uh, in on the, on the tree of heaven, that actually protruded down almost to, um, three times the length of the bud. Do you see the difference there? I'll show you, I'll show you the two together. I think I have a slide okay. of the two together. And then that little clumpy thing in the middle. That's the bud. Is, yeah, so, show us, yeah, circle it, Tom. Right here, this that, is the bud. That, that's, that's the bud the right there, yep. And this the is leaf, the, this is the leaf, leaf goes up around it actually here. So whereas in the other one, that leaf attached wherever the heart scar 
that leaf scar was, that's where the leaf attached. Well, in the staghorn, you can see that the leaf actually almost attaches, almost encircles that bud. Right. Okay. okay. And then this branch that we're looking at is pretty fuzzy. Yep. Is that different than the um, tree of heaven also? Yes. The tree of heaven yes. didn't look fuzzy. Tree of heaven is not is not as pubescent or fuzzy as that. Okay. So they are Thanks. very different. So this is a group. Are you seeing a new picture there, Eric? Yes. A group yes. of them. So in the foreground, and I have a I have a picture of them next to each other. But if you know where Mel Meltzer Fuel is uh, on Route 20 going into Painesville on the north side toward the railroad tracks, this is a grouping of Tree of Heaven and Sumac growing together. Okay. So they and. Basically, if you think about this, this was dirt that was dumped there. Uh, somebody came up with a dump truck, dumped a bunch of dirt there. And this is a picture of them where you're seeing um, in the foreground. And so on the left-hand side, you have staghorn sumac, the, and you can see the droop fruit sticking up. And in the background of that up in the air, you can see the seed pods or where the seeds were connected on the tree of heaven. So next to that, if you look at that picture, you'll see that the foliage looks very, very similar, but when they are in flower, it's very easy to tell them apart. So yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So you're seeing a compound. You, you, if you're just looking at foliage, you're right, Tom, it can be tough, but in this, you got to wait for that flower. It's easy. So compound foliage on both of them. But again, that fruit really, really makes it stand out. So Jane has a question. Are seeds, are the seeds the same color? So the seeds can be green when they start, mm. then red, then they turn to brown, and then they turn almost to like a tan color in the wintertime. So they will transition. Who's the tree of heaven? On tree of heaven. The, yeah. Typically on sumac, the, that first fruit will come out to be yellow but then it'll very quickly go to red and it'll stay that burgundy color almost all the way through winter until all those seeds fall off of that droop fruit. So good point. Um, but the, typically when they're both in flower, which is going to be that middle of July, that's when you can really pick up the very stark difference between sumac and tree of heaven. So you another question. go ahead, Diane. Sorry. You got me started now. So you're a, uh, you're leaf, your leaves are they like if you put them together um like you have here but it was sumac leaf and tree of heaven leaf are those leaflets like is it the same like they're the same number and all that kind of stuff or I is did, there a difference there too i did not pay diane but that was that was That's a great question that was a perfect great. question so the the leaflets tend to be there tends to be more leaflets i have a diagram coming up but it shows the comparison but the one difference is that sumac leaves are going to be toothed whereas the um the um tree of heaven leaves are going to be smooth and so, so go back yeah. one slide tom go back one slide where you've got the 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 actual tree of heaven and sumac together do you have it there? Yeah, right there. There so it is. It's it's hard. So to if you just out. look at those leaves, you just look at those leaves. You say you'd be hard pressed from this view to distinguish those two leaves one from the other. So you're right. Now it comes down to leaflets. If you go advance one time, it comes down to the number of leaflets. I'm not sure if they're. Whenever we use leaflets, we always use numbers. So if you look at the sumac, you've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, looks like 17. Looks like 17. So Eric, let me move forward two slides. So this, yeah. is, this is the bark on sumac. And I, again, I said that the, um, the tree of heaven has that kind of alligator looking bark. This tends to be smooth and a little darker. Are you seeing that bark picture, Eric? Yes, it's okay. up. This, but this is the diagram, uh, Diane, hopefully this will help you a little bit. But so Tree of Heaven, this is the compare and contrast in the two sets of leaves. So uh, Tree of Heaven, it can be up to four feet long, one leaf that contains all those leaflets, whereas Staghorn tends to be a little shorter. But again, what Eric was talking about can have 10 to 40 leaflets on, you know, per leaf. 
whereas staghorn sumac can have up to 27. But again, when you're looking at that, they kind of there's an overlap. So you can have the same number of leaves. Again, the uh, the base of the leaflet has a broad uh, tooth on it on Tree of Heaven, whereas the uh, the leaflets on the staghorn sumac are serrated. It's got a toothed margin. Um, the sap is clear on Tree of Heaven as opposed to milky and sticky. Um, and there is a definite odor on Tree of Heaven that is not present on sumac. So, but again, that if you look at leaf scar, that V-shaped, and I guess this is a better way to describe it, a V-shaped bud as opposed to a U-shaped bud. Does that help you, Diane? That's fantastic. Okay. Thank you. So Usually it, people start, master gardeners say, well, what is it? Dang it, Eric. Is it 10 or is it 40? Well, yes, yes, all, all the above, because okay. <laughs> They're not all the same. That's why you get that range. Wait a minute. Go back to that one. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> I won't keep doing this. It's I fine. So leaves. Yes. 10 to 40, 13 to 27. Are we talking the staghorn has uneven and the tree of heaven has even? So the, the staghorn sumac, good point. There tends to be a terminal leaflet on the tree ah. of heaven. Okay. And, the, and the and I'm sorry on the sumac tends to have a terminal leaflet which would give you that odd number whereas okay. the tree of heaven is going to be they're kind of uh, they're not opposite because the leaves are alternate but the on the leaf arrangement on the uh, compound leaf they fall uh, opposite of each other on that leaflet so that's a good point so this uh, this fruit you can kind of see the difference in the fruit coming up here and again you think about that droop fruit on the um, on the staghorn sumac, Tree of Heaven is nothing like that. But these will start out green, they will go to this, uh, to a reddish color, and then they will turn brown. This is probably, I think I took this picture July, July 12th of last year. So that gives you an idea. They'll probably be a little bit later this year. We got a little later spring coming, but that gives you the fruit of the, of the seed head on the Tree of Heaven. And if you look right up there at the base of those leaves, go back down. Right at the base, you see that little tooth, that little notch. That little tooth right up on the, just so above the seeds there to the left. So what Eric's talking about is down here on the bottom, if you rip that leaf off, you're going to expose that leaf yep. scar that is a heart-shaped leaf scar. That's where it's going to come from. Yep. And then moving nice. forward, again, the sumac leaf, totally different, very, very different. Um, not anywhere, not anywhere like the... Um, the the stag or the um, tree of heaven fruit. It's got that single droop fruit going up. So again, Eric was talking about phloem feeding, but I like this picture. So I talked about that kind of alligator skin look, um, and you can kind of see if you use your imagination, you put a head and a tail on this, you'd be thinking that you're looking at an alligator down in the Everglades. So um, <laughs> kind of a very good, but this is you can see the. The feeding spot, the phloem feeding that uh, damage from the um, spotted lanternfly. And again, our hope is that when you guys uh, scout for these trees, that you're not seeing any damage. And we'll talk about yeah. that because you, we want to, we want to avoid, we want to hope that we don't see this, but we're exactly. pretty sure that we're going to see it. Okay. So let's talk about the app. Okay. So we're going to do a little exercise unless you're on your cell phone or you're driving. Okay, if you're driving, do not do this. What I want you to do is pick up your cell phone, and let's all do this together right now. This is going to go real quick. So if you click on your cell phone, and you go to your app store, so APP store, or the, um, what is the, what is the um, Android phone? Is it Google Play? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. If you click on that. And then you click on the search bar. You're going to, let me move forward to this. Oh, wait, I'll go back. So you click on the search bar and you type in, and you got to type this in, the words Great Lakes. The whole word, Great Lakes, E-D-N. Let me fast forward to that slide so it would be easier. I'm just going to go through all these, Eric. I'll go back to if we have time. I like them. No, that's good. So I think the app, app store. Yeah. Ah, there we go. 
Next picture, you're going to type in Great Lakes EDN. So it looks like this. There we go. So Great Lakes EDN. And then just click on that. Now you'll get a screen that'll look like this. It won't say open. It'll say get. Hit the word get, put your phone down and look back up at my presentation, okay? Mine doesn't do that. It doesn't say get, Diane? Mine doesn't doesn't look like, it doesn't do this at all. Great Are you Lakes on Android? EDN. Yes. Did you type in Great Lakes EDN? Yes. And you don't see where it says Great Lakes EDN? You already have it loaded. I do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what so, you need to know about me. Okay. They call me a techno tard in my house, okay? <laughs> oh, so yeah, you have that loaded already. Well, but then right. that's good because you're you're gonna you know help us with the red next screen. So once you get this app, and we'll go back if we need to, but we don't really have to, then what you're gonna do is the screen that Diane, you wanna show us again your screen? Of course, I'd be happy to. So that's the screen that you're seeing on my screen? Yeah. Excellent. So on the top of that, you'll see species categories. And this is once you get the app loaded on your phone, species categories, and all you do is go down to trees, and if you click on the word trees, down on the bottom, second last one from the bottom is tree of heaven, El Ilanthus altissima. You click on that, and if you're looking at a tree of heaven, believe it or not, in Lake County, I have 14 places that have a tag on this, which is gonna make it easier for you guys to identify it. So if you click on tree of heaven, oh my you can go to this picture, or snap a picture. And this is the kind of cool thing about this app. Do you see where it says tap here to add a photo? Right below that, it says location. It gives the actual longitude and latitude of where that tree of heaven is located. You can take a picture, and down on the bottom, you can hit save. Okay, do you see where it says save down there? And you hit save, and it sends it away. So the way this app works, if you're taking a picture of Tree of Heaven, it goes to Kathy Smith, who is with OSU Division of Forestry. If you're taking what you think is a spotted lanternfly, which we'll talk about that in a second, it goes to Amy Stone, and she's our kind of invasive uh, species specialist in Ohio. And she will say, yes, that's a spotted lanternfly, or no, that's not. And then you would go ahead, and that gets recorded into a database. Again, if you're wanted, let's say that you think you see spotted lanternfly, you can go back to your categories, pick insects. This screen will show up and you'll see a picture of a Asian longhorn beetle. It's a, on this red background. You click on insects. And if you scroll down on the bottom, you'll see spotted lanternfly at the bottom of that screen. Same thing. You can go and you can take a picture of that. And this is really what when you guys are doing the scouting, and we'll go over this again, because we're not able to go out and scout right now until after July 7th anyway, so we'll review this again next meeting. But that being said, let's say that you took a picture of a trunk, but you did not see spot and lanternfly. You could send down here where it says negative, you could click the word negative and hit save, and what you're telling Amy Stone is that you looked at a tree, you did not see spot and lanternfly and you reported it. So that being said, the goal is, so uh, Eric, tell me when that comes up. It's up. Okay, so the goal is, this is 14 locations in, in Lake County that all have Tree of Heaven that I've identified and tagged with the yellow ribbon. Are you sure that that's all the trees in Lake no. County? Oh, no. Okay, that's good. So That's what I wanna hear. So no, but what I've done is I've basically, and these go all the way, I think the farthest east or the farthest west that I found it is on Erie Street. So it's right by the, um, that Willoughby Winery or whatever it is. And um, so, so basically I will send this list out to you um, for you to start 
contemplating whether you want to adopt one of these trees. So if you think about this, the, um, you know, so it starts out in, and these trees out there in Madison, subway parking lot, you know, maybe that's a tree that Carol Powers wants to, uh, wants to take over or these Madison urgent care or, um, you know, there, there's a, a different trees. There's one by Aldi's in Painesville. So again, this is a, a list that I will send out, but the goal is, and I, it's the same goal that I have for Eric's County and the same goal I have for Andrews County. I was out scouting on Sunday uh, or Saturday with my wife in Ashtabula. We found uh, six different or five different groupings of Tree of Heaven. Um, initially, I hadn't found anything, but Route 45, from Route 45 East, we begin to see some of Tree of Heaven. And so the goal is to have our master gardeners adopt these. And you guys are going to be boots on the ground asking you to check it once a week. We're going to turn that information in using the app on our phones and then send that away. Amy says, she, Amy says she knows where there are Tree of Heaven on Lake Erie College campus. I bet. Well, that would, and that's the other thing I would say is this. If you have locations of Tree of Heaven, email me and I'll definitely check them out and we can yeah. continue to kind of expand our database. If you're familiar with Fairport Harbor, this is Fairport Harbor Yacht Club, the entrance. There's a railroad track on the left-hand side of this picture that you don't see. This entire grouping of trees is all Tree of Heaven. So you can begin to see that it, it can really colonize an area um, pretty easily and pretty quickly, but there's, that's a grouping of trees. And um, so that kind of gives you an idea of what, you can know. Can I ask what, a question about where they lay their eggs? Yes. Sure. So we've been seeing them on trunks and I know we saw them in the rusty stuff. They don't, do they lay them on like the little skinny branches and stuff? Or is it mostly on the, like closer to the ground? Remember, they like flat surfaces. They, they like a flatter surface. Okay. So they're not going to lay it way out on, on the smaller stems. Okay. They will be at least a point where there, there'll be a flat area that they can then cover those, those eggs over. Right. Thank you. So, um, and before I conclude, what I will say is this. I had some slides in here about uh, some lookalikes, but uh, due to our timing, I think we're going to, we can do those at an IPM sometime with my group uh, later on because I can, you know, I can show those next time. So some lookalikes would be things like walnut, um, possibly hedge maple, um, some, of, some of those things. So we'll talk about that next time, but you've gotten the gist. I, I do want to conclude though, and this is something for Master Gardeners, you're really going to have to think about this. When we get together, we're going to have to social distance at least six feet apart. So you're seeing a picture of two geese doing a very good job of social distancing. My fear and Eric's is as well, because you guys like each other. And when you get together, that this is what we're going to see. So we're very concerned moving <laughs> forward that we don't want to see. And I know you guys are social beings and it's social time together, but we're really going to have to just be careful on that. And with that, I will stop sharing and open it.